Welcome to the Rich Dad Real Estate Show, where we talk about the good news and bad news. Real estate hosted by yours truly, Jaron Sustar. Hey, I need you guys to do two things. Number one, go down to the show notes and download my free ebook. It's going to get you started on buying real estate, uh, whether it be rentals or flips. And number two, if you're watching this on YouTube, like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on a podcast platform, Go ahead and give us a five-star review and leave us a rating. It will be greatly appreciated. Today, I have a special guest. Chad Carson lives right down the road from me, actually, another South Carolina boy, also known as Coach Carson. He's an author, investor, podcaster, and lifelong learner who used real estate investing to reach financial independence in his 30s. His current passion is teaching other investors how to build a small and mighty rental portfolio so that they can get out of financial grind grind and do more of what matters. So as I mentioned, Chad's based in Clemson, but you guys have lived all over the place. I think uh, I can't even pronounce one of them, Ecuador, uh, Spain, and you spent a lot of time writing about, about yourself in third person, hanging out with your kids, playing pickup basketball, helping out with nonprofits, and you're just an all-around great guy. So, Chad, thanks for being on the show today. Man, thanks for, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And can you announce, uh, pronounce that place in Ecuador that I'm looking at that I have no idea how to say? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Qu Cuenca, Ecuador, which, <laughs> which basically means a bowl. We lived in this uh, beautiful uh, city in Ecuador, 8,000 feet up, and it's like basically October weather in South Carolina – year round that's that's all it is so it's like a fall day beautiful wonderful people well, so we had a good time we lived there for 17 months that is amazing i got to visit there i feel like today's the first day of fall here in south carolina we woke up this morning there's a little frost on the ground so it's exciting yeah. so you talk a lot chad about the small and mighty investor you wrote a book called the small and mighty investor and so when when you say that phrase when you when you came up with that mantra what does that mean yeah, I'm the kind of guy who learns by touching the fire and getting burned. So I, I learned by doing the opposite of that. I, I went I went big, and you know I think that everybody has a path they take when they're in their finances and in trying to grow. And for me, I, I think we borrow goals from other people a lot of the time. Like I I know I did. Like I was like you know I copied some other people and they were flipping 50 houses a year and they were buying hundreds of rentals and I said that seems like a successful way to go. And I, my business partner and I copied that. But the problem was we did that right before 2007. The Great Recession came around, and it was we just we, we held on for dear life. We we survived all that, but I, I think the big realization from a life standpoint, I compare like having a business to sometimes like that story of Frankenstein. You know that scientist like built this. Uh, it was supposed to be like a, a friendly monster, actually. The the Frankenstein turned into a horror story, but my business turned into like a Frankenstein that it, it stood up and it came alive and it took over my life. It took all my time. It took all my you know, the flexibility. And so I, I sort of realized that, hey, having a small or a simpler business or one that just moves a little bit slower is actually desirable. Like it could actually get you, it could get me the things I wanted, which were traveling, play pickup basketball in the middle of the day, being with my family. And so I, I, it's finding that the sweet spot for a business. And I think for most people getting into rental properties, they didn't get in to have 150 units. They got it to have a lot of time, flexibility, cash flow. And I think the small and mighty approach just does, it fits those goals better. I love your analogy of, of Frankenstein. I was thinking about this last night from a business perspective. And I feel like you're like this. A lot of people who listen to this show, who listen to your podcast are the same way. Most of us are driven folks. We're wanting more. So we're trying to learn, learn, learn. And what happens is so many times we get a great idea based on somebody else's goals, like you just said. We open up this can of worms, and then a year or two into it, we're like, holy crap, how do I get these worms back in this can? Because <laughs> you started on a journey to be able to give yourself more time to do the things you love, and there's always going to be sacrifice to get to where we want to go. So there's no just gravy train to get to the place of financial freedom and being able to escape the rat race. But what Chad talks about and what we're going to unfold today is – Sometimes there's a quicker way to get there with less headache if you just think about it and do it the right way instead of always just thinking how large or how big can I go. Instead, let's be more tactical and strategic with how we go about it. All right, so how did you go about getting into real estate in the first place? Yeah, so my story goes back to Clemson, which you and I are both Clemson University go fans. And go Tigers. But I, I graduated from there, and I was thinking about going to medical school but I decided that I was, I was sort of tired from sports and from school. And I was like, I'm just going to do this entrepreneur real estate thing. And 
I actually got into flipping houses and wholesaling out of college. Like it was kind of a, uh, I don't know, say, not say gutsy. It wasn't that gutsy because I had nothing to lose. Like I did, I, I could live in my car. I was a you know college student, but it was I didn't I didn't have any way of making money. I basically had to just kind of scrape by and figure out how to flip houses and make a little bit of money assigning deals to other people. But that was the best thing for me personally because I I really value very highly freedom and flexibility over having a paycheck and have it's like to me that flexibility of being an entrepreneur was just amazing and it once I got the bug I was like I can't I can't go back I, I want to do this I always I always want to be an entrepreneur but I just sort of evolved from being a, f a fix and flip entrepreneur to being a, a buy and hold rental entrepreneur that's and that's more what my business looks like today is it's just rental properties that we we loan some money here and there finance properties but that's it's more of like the long term buy and hold kind of stuff so you started while you were in school, like y'all are flipping and wholesaling deals mainly? Yeah, it were right out of college. So I, I had a professor who I went, I went back and took some business classes because all I had was biology classes at school. <laughs> I had biology and German. I played football. But then so I, I basically the only thing I knew about real estate was I knew how to pronounce the uh, a tree. I, I knew I knew the species of the tree in the front yard and I could pronounce it in German because I took German classes. But I had no business, <laughs> business expertise, which is fine. Uh, so I went back and took a class and one of my first professors in business became a mentor and he became a, a private lender. Eventually he started loaning some money. So it's just the, those connections I made early on, you know, really helped out. And it's pretty cool because Chad was a, I gotta, I gotta brag on you, Chad. Chad was like a linebacker at Clemson. Clemson's a, a great university, which, you know, I'm not throwing any shade, Chad. They weren't necessarily <laughs> number one in the nation when you no, played there. We were no. still struggling, but I love a picture. I don't know if the team can put it up or if Chad will even allow the team to put it sure, up. But you guys go Google it because it is on Google. Chad Carson, Clemson linebacker, his neck is just massive. He's <laughs> he's yoked up. It's awesome seeing him. Yeah. yeah, I think it's cool. You know, you talk about being an entrepreneur right from the get-go, but you have no business experience. <laughs> You're just like, yeah. oh, yeah. let's just let's go try this. Real estate sounds cool. And so here you are graduating from college when so many people want to go the safe route. I've heard the saying, you know, uh, what, what, how's the saying go? Essentially a man is born and then he dies at 25, but he's not buried until he's 65. Ooh. And I think the, the whole premise of that is people get so comfortable and they make decisions, um, solely based on mitigating risk. Yeah. And yeah. if you ever listen to somebody like Elon Musk talk, he talks about, literally like taking li taking risk um f to find fulfillment in life and so i think some people go overboard with it but if we always live behind the safety net of you know how do i make the perfect decision how do i work the perfect job how do i work for the perfect company i don't want to branch out too far because that may not lead to my perfect life i don't think we're ever really living yeah yeah and so to see you take German and biology. <laughs> and then you say, you know what, I'm going to go out here and I'm just going to try to make something happen. And then you do it is pretty inspiring and, and, and an awesome story. Well, thanks. I, I think everybody has to take the risk where they are in their lives. Like I think if I would have started when I had a family and two kids, it would have been a little different story. It's like you could take you could take a jump out of an airplane and figure out how to put the parachute on when you're like a 22 year old kid. Uh, when you're a 35 year old and you have you know, kids, that's a, that's a little different story. But I think I heard a quote one time that said, like, the every growth opportunity you have is on the other side of your comfort zone. Hmm. Like, you, you, if you stay inside your comfort zone, like, you will never, ever grow. Like, you, you've got to, like, push the edge. you got to push. And, and I, I think, really, if you boil being an entrepreneur down, whether you're a, you have a day job and you're being an entrepreneur on the side as a side hustle, or whether you do like I did and just jumped in full time, you really have to get the emotional you have to get used to having emotional discomfort and that's just part of the game. Like there, there is no such thing as security. Like even if you're in a job, like it, it could be gone tomorrow. Like there, there is security is, is, is a, is something that's nice to have. It's nice to think about, but really the security you have is that gumption and that like, you know, boldness that, Hey, I'm going to go out and make money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to build relationships and time and time again, like when I'm, I've had a lot of hard times in, in my business. Nothing went perfect. I had a lot of screw ups I made, but that willingness to jump back in and, and face your fears, to build relationships with people, like that's that's what it's all about from the beginning to the middle to the end. And I, I feel like even in 2024, like right now, things are changing. Interest rates are changing. Like it's the same thing though. It's like, are you, 
willing to like adjust and pivot and be like an athlete. You know, you got to adjust to what the other team hits you in the, in the chin. Like, all right, <laughs> get back up. Here we go. Let's, let's do this. I think that attitude of being an entrepreneur is so critical. Yeah. I've, I've always said, I, and I realized it really early. And I think it was because I was an athlete and we're not here to prop up athletes. Although I think there's a lot of good things to be learned from, from playing high level sports or being in the military, having discipline when you're younger, but I, I'll never forget when I, I graduated and I started working um, at this uniform company. It was awful. It was up at 4.30, driving box trucks around, picking up dirty uniforms, you know, dropping off the clean. It was a terrible job. But I quickly realized that everybody around me, for the most part, was very complacent. And so they weren't pushing for more. They weren't striving for more. They weren't trying to get ahead or be better in life. And so I was like, holy crap, if I just apply – from an athlete's perspective, the same amount of work that I've been applying my whole life towards this sport, towards working, I think I can jump up to the top pretty quickly and they're going to pay me to do it. Like yeah. <laughs> it was the biggest enlightenment in the world. And so I think there's a reason people who aren't middle class or people who have built wealth, they had the financial freedom. They're called the 1%. I think they're called the 1% because 99% of people run into a roadblock or they run into discomfort, or they run into something that keeps them, that makes it hard for them to get to the next level, and they just stop. And so there's this huge pile of people down here that missed their destiny because they felt a little bit of discomfort. And you hit the nail on the head, man. It's like, hey, you're not going to get to where you want to go by being comfortable. And so getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is a great place to be, although it can feel scary. It's definitely worth it in the long run. So we talked about at the beginning, you know, you kind of opened up a can of worms. You thought you were supposed to build this big portfolio, and times have changed, and, and, and you've started strategically changing that to optimize what you have. But how did you go about building that portfolio at the beginning? What was your strategy? You know, what were the type of deals you were looking for? How did you fund them? All the good details. Yeah, so early on, I had to be flexible with private money. Uh, but it, this is not something everybody has to do at the beginning. But for me, I didn't have a traditional job. So if I had a traditional job, I would go out and get you know regular loans. Uh, that's, what I, that's what a lot of people do. But I had to go partner with people like my professor at Clemson. I partnered with him. Basically, he put up the money and I paid him a 10% interest rate uh, so as was a private lender. And that allowed me to flip some houses and kind of get my foot in the door without having a lot of my own cash in the deal. So that was the, that's the way I started. But as I grew, it was, it was, it was building on that, building relationships. I, I did a lot of seller financing. I got creative with, you know, just having private lenders, like I just mentioned. Also just, uh, you know, just being scrappy, like saving money and figuring out what I could. So that, from a financing standpoint, like that's, real estate's beautiful because there's a, you have the ability to leverage. You, have, you could use OPM, which I think I heard that from the Rich Dad books. When I first, you know, the very first mm. time I read a book was about using OPM and how powerful that was. And by the way, I just want, I want to plug that whole, the whole concept we were talking about entrepreneurship, reading the four quadrants, the cash flow quadrants early on in my career was like one of the just aha moments of like, this is a blueprint for where you can go. Like I started off, I, I never went into the employee quadrant, but I started off in the S quadrant and then I moved into the business owner quadrant and I started putting money in the I quadrant. I mean, that, that whole cash flow concept has been just a really kind of guiding principle, both early in my career, you know, doing that using OPM, but later on too, when I tried to jump to the other side and now I'm loaning money to other people, I'm the OPM for those other people. So I, I think that, you know, when you think about money, the ability to, to borrow money, to use OPM, like that was just, that was the eye opener for me like early in my career. And unfortunately, I feel like it's such a roadblock for folks. Um, and when you're in the game of real estate for a while, you understand that money is so plentiful. And I just want to like grab people lovingly and tell them, hey, don't let this hold you back. You know, I, I really want to get it through their heads. Do not let money hold you back. It is so plentiful. And I think so many people take a scarcity mindset or the blue collar or middle class mindset of if I'm going to ask somebody for money for a real estate deal, I'm a beggar and I'm bothering them. Yeah. And I think we have to shift that mindset to say, no, I am a business person who is offering another business person the opportunity to partner with me on a business deal. And they are blessed and lucky and should be thankful that I am bringing them in to my deal to make 12, 13, 14% interest in a four to six month time span. 100%. That's exactly the way it was, was for me. And I have people today I lo who loaned me money, you know, 20 years ago who are still good friends today and who thank me because I helped to fund their retirement. 
Like, it literally is like a, a gratitude both ways. So it's, it's incredible. We'll be right back with Coach Chad Carson. Are you worried about your financial security in these unprecedented times? If you are, the next minute could profoundly impact your financial security. Imagine waking up to find the economy has plunged and your portfolio has plummeted 30 to 45% while banks are in turmoil, holding your money hostage while waiting for FDIC intervention. Where would you turn? For many, this may sound like fiction, but it's a stark reality. For those that have money on the line, recently, America's awoke to both the NASDAQ and the Dow, plummeting over 1,100 points each and triggering a frenzy of sell-offs. History shows us how a single event can crash the market. Like the dot-com bubble of 1999, the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008, and the pandemic of 2020. But today, we're facing multiple bubbles, commercial real estate, stock, bonds, and banks. Combined with the relentless inflation, the threat of global recession, the specters of war, and you have the perfect storm. The consequences could be catastrophic, plunging us into unprecedented crisis. America is siding in the age of discord, with trust in institutions collapsing and the democratic norms unraveling. The quality of life for Americans has declined. Wealth is concentrated among the rich, while the median American family income stagnates, creating a dangerously top-heavy social pyramid. Moreover, hostile countries like Russia, China, and Iran are working to destroy the U.S. dollar. Gold is a no-matter-what store of wealth that you need. That's why Robert has been such an advocate of gold, and he trusts Allegiance Gold. Allegiance Gold is ready to help you incorporate physical gold as part of your portfolio and protect it against economic uncertainty. Visit protectwithrobert.com today to learn how you can qualify for up to $5,000 in free silver with a qualifying investment. Or give them a call at 844 robert Remember to mention Robert and Kim sent you when you contact Allegiance Gold. Secure your IRA or 401k today with Allegiance Gold. Visit protectwithrobert.com or call 844-3-ROBERT. Welcome back to the Rich Dad Real Estate Show, where we talk about the good news and bad news of real estate. I'm here with Chad Carson. And Chad, before the break, we were talking about using other people's money to buy real estate. It's been a powerful way that both of us have grown our portfolio. And a lot of people feel like it's a roadblock, but if they can just change that mindset to, hey, I'm not begging for money, but I'm giving somebody the opportunity to work a business deal with me, then it can unlock amazing opportunities that can change your life because you really only need one private lender and to unlock this world of wealth. If you can find that one person who will take a chance on you and give you capital to go buy a deal, two, three, four, five, and then you show that you can get the returns and pay them back what you guys agreed upon, they are going to keep feeding you over and over and over. You mentioned for the break, you know, you help fund somebody's retirement by the interest that they charged you through all the years that you did real estate. That's unbelievable. And so I want to encourage people, when you hear other people's money, don't write it off. Don't write it off. You're listening to two dudes from the middle of nowhere, South Carolina, who have built pretty strong life-changing portfolios off of using other people's money. And I promise you, if the biology and, and German study or Chad and the communications major, Jaren, can get it done, you can too. And so learn from us. And don't be scared to go to go attack it. So did you did, did y'all focus a lot, Chad, at the beginning on residential, or did you guys focus more in in the commercial space when you were starting out? It's almost always been residential. Uh, so yeah, I, I love the single family house. You know, when everybody else talks about, oh well, you know, you start off as a beginner with single family, then you grow into a small multifamily, but then when, once you begin your real career, now you're gonna get like big multifamily. I like, hate that. I, I just it annoys me. It's like you can tell it's my my pet peeve. It, this is another part of the to me the small money investor. I had a mentor named John Schaub, still do down in uh, Sarasota, Florida, and he wrote a book called Building Wealth One House at a Time. And he also always taught within that book that you, you can make it really, really big with little bitty deals. And it just, it, just, it just involves like sticking with it and doing it over and over and over again. And so, yes, we, we stuck to residential. We did get some bigger, like we have a 12 unit building. Uh, we have a 14 unit building and they're right in Clemson. There's student rentals, like one bedroom student rental. So we kind of got a niche there within the student rental business where having some small multifamily made sense. But I, I, just, I love small residential. They're, they're easier to finance. 
they're uh, often you know the big players the big commercial investors are sort of overlooking those so like i, I like the like small multifamily too because they're a little too small for the big players but they're a little sometimes if you get a bigger one they're a little too big for the small mom and pop investor as well so if, if you can find these little sweet spots there small resident you, you can make it as big as you want with a little bitty residential properties and the thing i love about it even if you're an advanced investor like i've kind of gotten to the stage where i'm talking to a lot of intermediate advanced and how do you get across the finish line of financial freedom and you think about it like a chessboard and your your properties in your portfolio are kind of like little pieces on the chessboard and if you have one or two big commercial properties that's like having one big piece or one big it's like a big ocean liner in the in the ocean it's really hard to steer this big old huge commercial property if you sell it you got a big tax hit you know you got to replace it with another property but if you got a bunch of little a swarm of little properties you can sell one or two here and there you can replace them with another one it's it's it's, it's a very healthy way to have a rental portfolio so i, I think don't don't let the big dealitis like convince you that you're not good enough because you have three or four little properties like that's the perfect place to be and you just just kind of attach to this identity of a small mighty investor where you only need two or three private lenders you only need four or five six properties that could be plenty that could be enough that's like that's the that's the mantra of a small mighty investor is that look i've got enough like i've got enough to do what's what i need to do in my life and now the question is like What's next? Like, what, what do I want to do when I grow up? When I'm 40 years old? When I'm 50? When I'm 60? Like, what, what's the the contribution I want to make? What's the how do I want to spend my time? Do I want to spend more time with my kids? Do I want to start a you know a teaching business like I've done? Do I want to go travel the world and live somewhere for 17 months? Like, that's that's the cool part about financial freedom is not having 150 units. It's being able to have the complete options and flexibility to do whatever you want with your life, and that's that's pretty amazing. Man, that's powerful. And jumping back to the single family, because I agree, and then I want to unpack some of the other things you said. I agree wholeheartedly. It frustrates me so bad. When people say, oh, you'll graduate to larger deals one day. There's no point. There's no, uh, there is a point. There's, there's large, I'm invested in large deals. And so I can't say that I don't buy in the commercial space, multifamily space. But for the everyday average person, you can change your life off the single family home. They're easy to find. They're easy to comp. You know what they're worth because you just look and see what the ones around them sold for. So you immediately know what it's worth. It's easy to fund. The banks lend to them all the time. And then one of my favorite things about them is the exit strategy. Yeah. So just like you said, when you have those large commercial properties, if you're going to go sell that, you're going to have to sell it to another investor. But if you have a, a strong and mighty portfolio of rentals, yeah, you could go sell a rental or the whole portfolio to another investor. Or what is the American dream? It's to own your own home. So then you can make the property nice when you get ready to sell, fix it up, flip it up to market standards, and then sell it and give somebody their starter home or somebody their dream home. And so, you know, it's so easy to get in. It's so easy to exit. It, it makes it almost a no-brainer. And then you started talking about, you know, four or five, six properties is all you need to, to be successful. In our last episode, we had a gentleman named Ryan Burnham. He actually works for my company, but he, he got started with house hacking um, and then build his portfolio through house hacking and then mainly does midterm rentals now. And today he lives the most flexible life I've ever seen. I mean, he'll live in Minnesota for a couple months where his family is. Then he's down in Florida. Then he's in Austin, Texas. Then he's overseas. And he literally has the freedom to do what he wants because he set his portfolio up correctly. Now, mind you, it's seven units. It's seven units. But the way that he structured it all it is paying him enough cash flow to essentially it covers his his lifestyle and he only needs a little bit of additional money coming in on the side to allow them to do you know the additional special things and so when you keep keep your portfolio small and mighty i think uh i think it's it's pretty amazing so you went y'all went large how many did you get up to when you guys were buying rental properties yeah i mean we we've been over 100 units and we kind of fluctuate here and there so you know, I have about 33 buildings. I have a 50-50 business partner, so let's like kind of qualify that. But even with that, I'm on the bigger side of the small and mighty. You call me my medium, medium and mighty, maybe. It's like more my, my size. But I've also you know, been doing this for 21 years, and it's been a slow you – know, we, we got up to 60 properties during that kind of big sprint up the mountain back in 2006 and seven, And then we've kind of gone up and down and up and down. And to me, like the, you know, there's no problem with growing. I, the, one of the issues I had with my own journey, the thing I, I think I did not as wisely, it was like I was climbing a mountain and I tried to sprint up the mountain. 
I just try to go straight up. <laughs> like it, 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 I'm not a, rock, a mountain climber, but everything I've studied about mountain climbing, like that's the that's a bad idea. Like to go straight up Mount Everest, you would die. Like your 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 lungs would just collapse. And so I, I think entrepreneurs, it's a very similar thing. Like just pace yourself. Like take your time. Like anything is possible if you have reasonable time frames, right? So it's like you don't have to spread up the mountain. And I think that's where out of the, the few people I've known gone out of business, not few, there's more than a few people have gone out of business in real estate. It's because they got too aggressive, they went too fast, they got over leveraged. So yeah, that's where, where we are now is we have 33 buildings, about 100 units, but we've paid off a lot of our debt. We have you know very low loan to value, about 15, 20% of our total value of our whole portfolio is, is the amount of debt we have. So it's wow. like we have a lot of equity, a lot more cash flow, safe place to be. And we're just kind of like, okay, we we're in pretty good, sh pretty good shape. Yeah, that's, I remember the last time we talked, you were saying, hey, we're, we, we got up to 100 units over the last, whatever, 20 years. And now we're optimizing and we're starting to pay them down. And, and I think that's powerful because you're being strategic with what you've done. You leverage debt, which we talk a lot about on this show. Like debt is a very, very powerful tool if used correctly and used safely. And you were able to scale. You probably didn't, if you, if you, and you can answer this today, you probably didn't even have to get to 100. You probably would have been okay if yeah. you all would have bought 30 units or yeah. 25 units. Yeah. But you were able to get in at a time to where you got great deals on properties and then you were smart enough to hold them. And so then instead of just continuing to climb, can it continue to add more and not optimizing the portfolio? You guys started paying them down, which obviously has increased your cash flow, which then allows you to live anywhere you want in the country. Yeah, or the world, off, really. Yeah, paying off debt's one of those like you know that's one of those hot button issues on the internet when you talk about, when you talk about that with real estate investors. But I, I think hear me out here. Like if when you're first starting, it makes a ton of sense to have debt because who who has a lot of money sitting around, right? You need leverage when you're growing your portfolio. Having a good return on investment makes a ton of sense to use safe debt. But the argument I make is when you get this third step of the journey, which I don't think many people talk about, I call it a harvester. Some people call it like an ender, uh, ender stage. But basically, you have a different set of criteria. Like you, it's, it's like a football metaphor. Like when you're in the fourth quarter and you're on the 10 yard line and you're winning the game and there's like a minute left on the clock, like you don't try to throw a long pass or you don't, you don't try to throw it all the way down the field. Like what, what good football teams do is they start playing conservative. Like they run the ball. They even at the very end of the game, they take a knee. And I'm not saying you have to be like that conservative, but the point is, this is what Warren Buffett and other people who are really smart about investing say, is like, why would you risk what you already have to get something you don't even need? Mm. Like, why? Like, why, why would you? Like, is, 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 that's a good question to ask. Is it maybe it's because you just love being a hustler. You're, you want to be Elon Musk and you want to take over the world. Like, cool, that, that's fine. But it's not because you need financial freedom because you could have had financial freedom back when you decided to keep on going. And so I, I think that's what I like to do, just shine a light on that. Like say, hey, just get to financial freedom first. Build this little fortress portfolio, pay off some debt, have this little portfolio that pay, pays you 10,000 bucks a month, 5,000 bucks a month, whatever you want, right? And then if you want to keep growing, do it. Like th th you could have as much ambition as you want in your life, but give yourself the option and, some, and pause a little bit and say, what do I want to do? What do I want to be ambitious about? And what might happen is like, I still, I'm still in business. I like, I like being in business, but I kind of shifted the type of business I was in, something I'm more passionate about. I like teaching, I like coaching. Um, or maybe you like, I, I started a nonprofit in my town because I'm really passionate about building walking and biking trails because I was so frustrated that I was pushing my kid in a stroller and we couldn't get anywhere to a park without getting run over by a car. Like I was frustrated. And so there are things in your life that you could go solve and be a problem solver. They have nothing to do with money but they just need to be done. And you as a financially free entrepreneur can then go spend your time, the most valuable resource in the world, you can spend your time doing that because you're financially free. And I think that's like that's like a really cool place to be. Choose that number. What number do you need coming in per month? Go obtain it, give yourself the choice. And then if you wanna keep scaling, do it from there. Or you may do like Chad. You may say, you know what? I got other passions in life that I wanna go pour my energy to. Just be careful about the can of worms you open. I got to ask, because not everybody I have on this show went through it. What was it like owning real estate through 2007, 2008, 2009? Yeah, it was a roller coaster. I mean, it was an emotional roller coaster for us. And 
I'll tell you, I, I want to just really emphasize that the, the people you hear on the show who are sur- survived that were not perfect. Like I made a ton of mistakes. Like I made, I made a purchase, a, a dumb purchase one time where we bid on a property at an auction. It's a bankruptcy auction. And I overbid, I got all excited and emotional and I kind of got competitive with another investor. And I had to call my business partner on the way back home say like, I just screwed up. Like I just bought this property. We, we just had already bought a bunch of properties. It was 2007. And so I, I screwed up and I, that was very scary we had to scramble a little bit to figure out how to get the money and build, you know, buy this property. But the scary thing was, was like people were losing their jobs. They were, you know, you had a lot of turnover. We made some mistakes underestimating repairs. So basically, like, if you had to boil it all down, it was a cash crunch. Yeah. So we we sp- we we were eating into a lot of the cash reserves that we built. And so the best, smartest thing we did was having like a huge cash reserve going into the Great Recession, so that we we had to spend some of that. But the other thing we did really well, I think, was just pivot. So we, you know, we, we were flipping houses. We had to get really good at managing properties, really good at operations and systems. And we also had these relationships with our, our lenders going back to other people's money. We had long-term seller financing. We had private money. We had one or two local bank loans. So we had these strong relationships with our lenders. And where other people had a lot of their loans called due and they had to like you know come up with millions of dollars at once, that's what really put people out of business. All the way from the small investors, all the way up to like Fortune 500 companies went out of business because they had their, their loans called due during a credit crunch. And so we, I was really paranoid about that even before the recession. We had long-term loans. We didn't have these balloons that ballooned in three years and commercial notes with uncallable features. We had a lot of 10, 15, 30-year financing. And that combined with the cash money that we had in the bank, those are the, we, we got kind of lucky about that, that we just were, we were smart with those two things that they kind of compensated for all the stupid stuff we did as well. I can't imagine. It had to be. It had to be quite the time. I mean, when yeah. we got a little taste of it there for a second in what 2020 during during COVID, it was just a quick, yeah. you know, I want to call it manufactured hit, but it was based off of just the news of, of the outbreak. Whereas, you know, there was actual bad financial implications back in 08 and 09 and holding on for dear life. I think one of the biggest things about real estate is I, I'm, I'm actually teaching on this in two days where I talk about if you look at a graph, from a macro level, real estate goes up based on data. Like it, it goes up in value from a macro view. And so I think you got to get in. You got to get into the game. You got to start buying it, whatever your strategy may be. But I think the long term winners are those who then can mitigate the downside because you're going to exactly. get the upside just because of the asset. Yes. So, how do yeah. we mitigate that downside? And uh, you made a good point long term stable loans. And then keeping some cash on hand to be able to protect you when those times come. Where do you think the the market's heading? You know, rates finally got cut for the first time in a while, yeah. uh, not uh, too long before this episode. What do you see? What do you see happening in the real estate market? I'm so bad at predicting because I just get, I just told my story how 2007 I ran into a brick wall. But what I will say <laughs> is that I am so bullish long run on real estate because I'm really bullish just on. I've traveled around the world. I've looked at other places like. The, the, the ingredient, the, the little soup of ingredients we have in the United States of, you know, contracts and entrepreneurs and land. And I mean, we, we got a good thing going on, folks. And so if you buy and you hold for the next 10 to 20 years at a good location that's growing, you get safe loans, you have cash set aside, you do things conservatively, like it is, to, is still a great time to get investing. I'm doing that. I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm very optimistic over the long run. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a bunch of ups and downs. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a recession a couple of years from now. Like I have no idea, but I'm, I'm ready for the recession. I've got a lot of cash set aside. I'm conservative. If you're new to the investing world, you should get long-term loans, set cash aside. Be Don't buy any old deal. Make sure it's a good deal. If, if you do that, and if you're a small and mighty approach, you're not going to over, you're not going to overextend yourself. Just pace yourself and you'll you'll be just fine what is it those an index investor say chad uh time in the market is more important than timing the market dollar cost average baby just Absolutely. keep buying every year you're not gonna be able to time the market yeah. i looked at yeah. a graph and maybe we can get this graph pulled up to where i'm pretty sure it goes to i don't have it in front of me the 1920s 30s 40s the graph starts there and it goes to essentially today and i believe i'm going off memory here in that entire time frame, call it 80 to 100 years, there's only been seven years where real estate has either gone down or stayed the same in value. And I'm pretty sure, off of memory, four of those years 
were like 08, 9, 10, and 11. Wow. And th- that's when real estate went down. The other three years were scattered throughout the last 80 to 100 years, and it actually pretty much just stayed the same. And it's, it's amazing what can happen if we can remove emotion and replace it with logic and just make our decisions based on logical data, make good qualified decisions, um, you'll put yourself in a, in a good spot for the future. Do you attribute most of your success to talent or hard work? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it's a combination, but I, I think I've, I've outworked my talent for sure. Like I was, as a, even as a middle linebacker in football, like I had pretty good talent just to get there, but I overworked some of the people who are more talented than me. So I rely on that. I feel like it's a, it's almost a philosophical thing. If that's the thing you can control, like you might, you can't control your talent. Like you either have it or you don't. But man, you can work at something. If you're this good, you can get this good by working, and you can close that gap, whatever that is, and let the cards fall where they may after that. But I, I love it. I'm a, I'm a hustle guy. I love this. I love the old like Hoosiers movies and the, you know the hustle hustle stuff. You know that's where I get excited, and I think that's what the real small mighty real estate investor. We are, we're hustlers. Like we are we are the people who kind of go out and make things happen. We're the small business owners. We're the people who have five or six rentals that just make it happen. So I I, I love that idea. You guys go check uh, Coach Chad Carson out at coachcarson.com backslash RD. Go check him out on Instagram at Coach Chad Carson, YouTube Coach Chad Carson, Twitter Coach Chad Carson, and get his book, The Small and Mighty Investor. I have it. It's not sitting on this shelf. It's sitting on my other shelf. Fantastic book. Chad, thank you for joining the show today, and uh, we'll see you another time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jan. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Rich Dad Real Estate Show, where we talk with Coach Chad Carson about being the small and mighty investor. If you're watching on YouTube, go like this video, share it with somebody, subscribe to the channel. If you listen on the podcast platform, give us a five-star rating, leave a review, let us know how we're helping you. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.